Good morning. There it is. Good morning. Welcome to Convocation. Great to see you all this morning. Thank you for being with us. Uh, we have a few campus announcements before we introduce our speakers, so I will get started on those. Hi, so Christmas Gala is coming up on December 6th. That's another campus traditional event. What it is is a formal dinner followed, followed by a dessert reception and a jazz concert. So similar to the concept of Fall Fest, you're gonna, the cafeteria will be closed that night. So you're gonna have to pick up your tickets from the Office of Student Life to be able to have dinner that night. You, it'll be in Mem Hall. I'll send the email reminders and updates. But just the main thing, remember to pick up your ticket so that you can have dinner. Thank you. Hola. Hi. Um, the ODI and the Department of Languages here at Bethel College are partnering for this event. Uh, this is the Latinx Leadership Panel. Uh, it's going to be on Thursday, this Thursday, um, at 7 p.m. Earlier at Mojo's at 5.30, uh, we're going to have a meet and greet uh, session with uh, the three of, two of the three students that are going to be part of the panel. Uh, this is going to be interesting panel just to learn about um, Maribel Sanchez, Alexi Barra, and Denise Menjivar. They are WSU students. They are involved in the Student Government Association at uh, WSU. One of the students is a Dreamer, is a DACA student. Uh, it will be interesting to hear from them about their experiences um, uh, of uh, being Latinos uh, and Latinas in the country. So if you can make it, that will be great. Thank you. Hi, everyone. So how many of you were originally born outside of Kansas? Okay. How many of you were born outside of the U.S.? Okay. So um, I'm Linda Moyo, and this... I'm Ronald Gray. And Diversity Council and the International Students Club are hosting what we call Bethel Friendsgiving. So this will be this coming Saturday at 6 p.m. at the Bethel College Mennonite Church basement. We're going to have a lot of food from various cultures, and we're also gonna have a talent show. We're gonna have a display from some of the international students um, facts about their home countries, and we're just gonna have a lot of fun. So I hope you can show up, and there's gonna be a lot of food, like I said, and so come and have a good time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, to introduce our speaker today, I would like to welcome to the stage Peter Gorzin. Good morning. And welcome to the second of two lectures of the 2019 Bible Lectures, made possible by a generous endowment by the Hartzler Foundation in honor of J.E. Hartzler and, fa and family. And a special welcome to any guests from the community who are joining us this morning for this lecture. Uh, some of you in the audience today are seniors taking the Bethel College Signature Capstone course, Basic Issues of Faith and Life, affectionately known as BIFL. Each year, all seniors read a selected biblical book and a contemporary book, and then sit for oral interviews over these readings. I believe those interviews are set to begin soon. Strength and blessings. We are fortunate to have with us today Dr. Melissa Archer from Southeastern University in Florida. Dr. Archer's doctoral research focused on the book of Revelation, and we are delighted to have her on campus to help us engage the book of Revelation and ponder its significance for our own day and age. Biffle students uh, taking Biffle this semester can look forward to meeting, visiting more with Dr. Archer during your class period this afternoon. And she'll also be in the, in the cafeteria over the lunch hour and you're welcome to come join conversation then as well. Dr. Archer and her husband are the parents of two adult children and three young grandchildren. Uh, yesterday, during a stimulating and rich exploration of the book of Revelation, Dr. Archer uh, highlighted a number of the worship themes that stand out in that book. 
And this morning, she'll be continuing that discussion as she reflects on Worship Marks Us from Revelation chapter 13. Please join me in giving a warm Bethel College welcome to Dr. Melissa Archer. Well, good morning. Thank you. There you go. It's good to see you. Uh, it's cold out there today, and I'm happy that you're here. You could have stayed home, could have stayed in your dorm, but I'm really glad to see you here. How many of you were here last night? Okay, excellent. I'm glad you came back. I didn't scare you away. Too bad. I do want to thank um, Peter for the generous invitation to come here and for his hospitality. I've, I've very much enjoyed myself while I've been here staying in the guest house and touring your campus. It's beautiful. I just saw your, uh, the chapel that is upstairs and the pipe organ. Gorgeous. Um, so I've really enjoyed my time on your campus. Uh, and I do bring you greetings from Southeastern University in Lakeland, Florida, where it is warm and sunny uh, today. I appreciate uh, your institution here. I appreciate the historic roots of your college. I appreciate your commitment as a denomination to peacemaking. I believe it is a much needed message in today's world. And then it goes nicely with what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, there are those of us in the Pentecostal tribe of Christianity, of which I am a part, who are also committed to nonviolence and to peacemaking. So uh, I would join you in that endeavor. So last night I talked about um, kind of a, um, an overview of the way that I've looked at the book of Revelation, uh, not maybe from your typical standpoint of just kind of trying to drill into the eschatology, but looking at it as a liturgical text and seeing what emerges when we look at Revelation through the lens of, of liturgy. So some of that will be rehearsed today as I, as I get into this particular passage. So if you were here last night, you're going to hear some things again. If you weren't here last night, I hope there's enough in here that will give you a sense of kind of what I talked about as well. And I am going to keep my eye on the clock so that I don't talk too long. So our scripture for today, as was mentioned, comes from uh, Revelation 13, and I believe we're going to have that up there for you. Yes, these are verses 11 through 17. Then I saw a second beast coming out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, but it spoke like a dragon. And it exercised all the authority of the first beast on its behalf and made the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose fatal wound had been healed. And it performed great signs, even causing fire to come down from heaven to the earth in full view of the people. Because of the signs it was given power to, be, to perform on behalf of the first beast, it deceived the inhabitants of the earth. And it ordered them to set up an image in honor of the beast who was wounded by the sword and yet lived. And the second beast was given power to give breath to the image of the first beast, so that the image could speak and cause all who refused to worship the image to be killed. And it also forced all people, great and small, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hands or on their forehead, so that they could not buy or sell unless they had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of its name. The word of the Lord. <laughs> Pentecostals have been fascinated and tormented by the book of Revelation simultaneously. When I was young, and I, I mentioned this last night, when I was young, there was a series of movies that we showed at our church. This was back in the 70s, long, long time ago. I'm old, uh, back in the 70s. And um, the, the one that I distinctly remember was called A Thief in the Night. And I heard an oh yeah, okay, someone knows that movie. Yes, you had to have psychotherapy as well. Um, <laughs> but the premise of the movie was, was this, you missed the rapture. And because of that, you're, the only way you're going to make it into heaven uh, is to be beheaded by the Antichrist. I mean, it was just a horrible movie. It had guillotines and baskets to collect the heads in. And, and it was just traumatizing. And I was about six or seven years old. And so uh, if I would happen to come home from school and my parents would, would be gone for some reason, I would literally hide behind the couch because I was convinced that I had indeed missed the rapture. And so I was 
scared and really traumatized by the book of Revelation. I did not like to read it. I did not understand it. And I certainly uh, did not find a whole lot of value in it. My dad tells stories uh, about um, fear that existed at the time over credit cards and whether they were the mark of the beast or barcodes and whether they were the mark of the beast. So this passage has um, kind of taken root in Pentecostalism, and I think even in American culture to some extent. Just Google, you know, who is the beast or who is the Antichrist. By the way, Antichrist doesn't appear in Revelation, but we take that, that kind of Antichrist with a capital A and, and come up with this figure that we merge from these images that we have of, of the beast. And so this idea of a, of a figure who's going to kind of have this worldwide domination comes to us from these stories about the beast. And just go ahead and Google that and see what kind of names appear on that list for who is the Antichrist. So this text that we're reading today comes in the middle of the narrative of Revelation. And we can't cover the whole of the text in the short time that we have this morning, but there's a couple things I would say at the outset about the book of Revelation in general. First of all, I believe that Revelation is a book for the church and about the church. I believe it is about faithful endurance until the end, until Jesus returns. And I believe at its heart, Revelation is about worship, about modeling true worship and exposing false worship. And this text speaks to that. So our, um, the book of Revelation is written by someone named John, and we're told that he is exiled on the island of Patmos for the word of God and the testimony about Jesus. And, and we're told that he's been caught up in the spirit, and he has these amazing visions that we find in the book of Revelation. He's been shown the heavenly throne room where he sees worship taking place. From heaven, he sees the, out, the opening of the seven seals and the sounding of the seven trumpets. These are judgment cycles that um, unleash kind of terrifying things on the earth. I don't have time to unpack this, but maybe it will come up in the, in the class uh, at 2 o'clock for those of you that are going to be in there. Um, but these judgment scenes are designed to uh, elicit repentance. Uh, they're intended to produce repentance from the inhabitants of the earth. But over and over again, we're, we see that the inhabitants of the earth refuse to repent, refuse to give up their worship of idols. And so this theme of false worship comes into play. But alternating with these judgment scenes are worship scenes. So we'll have kind of a, a scary scene of judgment, and then the very next scene is a worship scene, and then another theme of judgment, and then another worship scene. And so John kind of juxtaposes judgment and worship throughout the narrative. So no matter what is happening on earth, John shows us that God is being worshiped in heaven. As communities of the Lamb, the churches are to join in the activities of heaven, which includes and is centered on worship. Worship declares the sovereignty and justice of God in all of God's ways. That all of heaven is engaged in worship models what the churches should be doing, worshiping and proclaiming the good news of the true kingdom. So the churches to whom John is writing, the seven churches of Asia, that are introduced to us in chapter 1 and then written to in chapters 2 and 3 with the prophetic messages, they are to see themselves as communities of the Lamb engaged in the worship of God. So in chapter 12, which comes right before the chapter that we have read our text from, John tells another story. And John says that he sees a great sign that appears in the heaven. And so this language of sign alerts us as readers that something important is happening and that we should pay attention to what John is going to show us. John sees a woman clothed with the sun, about to give birth to a child. And at her feet stands a red dragon with seven heads and ten horns who waits to devour the child when he is born. And John will tell us that this dragon is none other than the ancient serpent, Satan, the deceiver of the whole world who has been cast out of heaven. And when the child is born, he is snatched up to heaven. The child is Jesus, and the focus is on his incarnation and ascension. So kind of taking the whole life of Jesus and, and putting it into this one thing. He's born and he's ascended. 
The scene reinforces the idea that the incarnation that we celebrate at Christmas time is more than just away in the manger and sweet baby Jesus. The incarnation is about spiritual warfare. After the woman flees to the wilderness to a place prepared for her by God, the angry dragon wages war against the rest of her offspring, those who hold to the commands of God and to their testimony about Jesus. This would be John's audience, the seven churches, and it would be you and I as well. This finally brings us to chapter 13. And this is a frightening chapter. In this chapter, God appears to be absent, and evil appears to be unstoppable. God's name is blasphemed by the beast, and God's people are conquered. And I really believe that these chapters form the heart of the book of Revelation. And in these chapters, we learn about spiritual opposition to the people of God. And that opposition comes in the form of the dragon, who's been identified as Satan in chapter 12, and two beasts. One beast comes from the sea, and one beast comes from the land. Did any of you ever watch when you were young? Did you ever watch Power Rangers? Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In Power Rangers, the evil villain often would go to the sea to summon up some monster, right? Am I, am I right on that? I am right on that. I know I am because I watch Power Rangers with, with my kids. Um, but it re when I read this chapter in Revelation, it reminds me of that. So the dragon is standing by the shore of the sea, and out from the sea comes this beast, right? I knew I shouldn't have let my kids watch Power Rangers. The evil, evil show. But anyway, so we have the beast from the sea, the beast from the land, along with the dragon, kind of form this, this evil trinity that's a, a, a parody of the true trinity. God, the one who sits on the throne. Jesus, who's depicted as the lamb in Revelation, and the spirit. So we have kind of these competing narratives that are happening. With this um, dragon and the two beasts, John is likely symbolizing uh, the, the Roman Empire, the Roman emperors, the idea of Pax Romana, um, the worship of, of the emperors, all of this kind of comes into play in his symbolism. So let me tell you just briefly about this first beast because it's important to understand that beast to get to the second one. So we're told about this first beast who comes out of the sea and he has a slaughtered head. He has this incurable wound and it is healed presumably by the dragon and this healing results John says, in the whole world being filled with wonder, and they worship this first beast. They even sing a song to the beast. Who is like the beast, and who can make war against him? And John tells us that all the inhabitants of the world worship the beast, except those whose names have been written in the book of life. John says in chapter 13, verse 10, right before our passage, this calls for patient endurance and faithfulness on the part of God's people. So we have this first beast that is being worshipped. Then we're introduced to the second beast, and this comes from the text that we read today. And this beast is a real master of deception. John tells us that he has two horns like a lamb. Well, in Revelation, Jesus is the lamb. This beast speaks like a dragon, Satan is the dragon. This beast makes the world worship the first beast. This beast makes great signs and wonders appear, even calling down fire. If you go back to chapter 11 in the book of Revelation, you have the story of the two witnesses. And one of the things that the two witnesses can do is signs and wonders, even calling down fire. So we have all of these parodies of things that we've seen in the, in the book of Revelation that represent God and God's people now being kind of attached to this image of the beast. The second beast makes an image of the first beast and gives breath to it, causing it to speak. The beast makes everyone take a mark on their hand or forehead. They can't buy or sell with it. So this is a picture of kind of economic hardships, bad times for the people of God. But God has already marked his own people. In Revelation 7, God puts a mark on his people. 
um, not, a, not a physical mark. This is, this is spiritual. This is symbolic language to say that God knows who his own are. And finally, this second beast kills those who refuse to worship the first beast. Those who are killed, John says, are those who refuse to worship the beast. Well, who are those that refuse? Those whose names are in the Lamb's Book of Life. John's churches, you and me. So if you are in this room and you have committed yourself to Jesus as Savior and Lord, you are marked by God. God knows that you are his child. Your name is in the book, so to speak. We like to use that language as Pentecostals. Our name is in the book because we take this reference from this passage. I don't believe that God needs a literal book to keep track of his own. This is, again, symbolic language reminding us that we belong to God and that God knows us. The story of the saint's encounter with the beast reveals what it truly means to be an overcomer in the book of Revelation. And I shared this last night. Revelation's definition of what it means to overcome comes to us in chapter 12, verse 11. Maybe you've heard this verse. In talking about the dragon, we hear this verse. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. It's why they can refuse to worship the beast. Because they share in the lamb's victory. And because they know that the God whom they serve is able to raise them from the dead. It's in this story in Revelation 13 that the importance of worship is fully exegeted for us. Now, I think there's all kinds of ways to worship, and the apocalypse gives a number of ways, and we talked about some of these last night. So um, there, there are worship acts that we do. Uh, in Revelation, it's singing hymns, it's prayers, it's falling down before the throne, um, it's repentance, it's all kinds of things, but we also understand that worship is our lifestyle. It's the way that we live in honor to God. So worship is not just something that we do. Worship is something that, that we are. We are worshipers if we are following after Jesus. So I think worship at its heart is about identification. It's about allegiance. It's about loyalty. Worship aligns us with the one that we choose to worship. This is what I think Revelation wants to challenge us with. And that is this. Who are you going to worship? Lamb or beast? Who by your lifestyle are you aligning with? In its first century context, John is likely talking about the empire of his day, the Roman Empire. In chapters 17 and 18, John will go on to symbolize the Roman Empire as Babylon, the great prostitute. She is aligned with the beast. She even rides on the beast. He will show her as an exploiter, as power hungry, as an economic superpower, as arrogant, as a human trafficker, and as drunk on the blood of the saints. But her facade, the public perception of her, is so alluring to John that he's almost tempted to worship her. See, false worship is subtle. In the 21st century, we have to talk about the empires of our day, including our own. Our desire should not be for any human empire, but for God's empire, for the kingdom of God. Revelation is going to portray that kingdom symbolically in New Jerusalem. The kingdom of heaven, the new heaven, the new earth, the peaceable kingdom where God will dwell with us, where there's no more pain, no more sorrow, no evil, no death. God's kingdom. J. Nelson Craybill states this, empires, whether Egyptian, Roman, or modern, warp worship. And God wants God's people to be free from their ideology. True worship is a political act. It's an act of resistance. It would have been for the first century Christians to proclaim Jesus is Lord was a political statement. Why? Because Caesar is Lord. So to make that proclamation was to say my allegiance belongs 
to someone else. It's the same way for us today. Worship is a political act. So the hymns that we read about in Revelation are songs of resistance. The prayers that we hear prayed in Revelation are prayers of resistance. John tells such a dramatic story of beasts and horns and multiple heads and all of these things. It's, it's, it's so dramatic because the consequences are so important. So I think just like John's audience had to discern who the beasts were in their own day, we too have to discern who the beasts are in our day. What is it that demands our worship? What is it that calls for our allegiance? There's nobody walking around with name plaques on saying, I'm the beast. There's no seven-headed creatures walking around that we can say, whoa, there's the beast, stay away. Mm -mm. No, it's much more subtle than that. We have to discern what those things are that seek to draw us away from true devotion to God. On the level of empire, what are some things we might name? Well, we might talk about civil religion. After all, we have national liturgies. We have pledges of allegiance. We have national holidays that almost become holy days. We have sacred texts that aren't scripture. Civil religion can become something that wears away at our self-identity. Our first allegiance is to God. We are citizens of that kingdom before we are citizens of national kingdoms. What about nationalism? What about a spirit of violence that demands the blood of our youth? What about racist ideology? What about sexism? What about discriminations? Could we call those beasts in our day? Or maybe we can bring it down even to a personal level. What about materialism? What about Instagram? There's a beast if ever there was one. What about gaming? What about addictions? What about sports? What about, what about, what about? I think there's so many things that we could say, this tries to war me away from my devotion to God. Maybe it's a person in our own lives. We have to practice discernment, both as the church and as individuals in the church. This is what I think Revelation challenges us to do. Michael Gorman, who has a great book on Revelation called Reading Revelation Responsibly, he says, when the church publicly worships God, the community, like John, is caught up in the spirit of God, becoming a sacred space. Our imaginations and our lives become increasingly converted into the image of the Lamb. I think that's so important. The values of the kingdom need to become our values. The things that God values need to be the things that we value. We are galvanized against the values of the world when we are focused on the values of God. We resist the false liturgies promoting hate and fear of others when we think about the works of the Lamb and we think about some of the hymns in Revelation. I quoted this one last night, but I think it's such a powerful him that reminds us of what the kingdom of God is all about. In Revelation chapter 5, 9 through 10, this is the song John hears in heaven. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain, and with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation, and you have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God. What I love about the kingdom of God and the picture that we get in Revelation, and we see it in chapter 7 as well, is that people from every tribe are gathered around the throne. See, the kingdom of God is multi-ethnic, multinational. That's something we have to remember, particularly in a day and age in which our world, not just our own country, but our world is dealing with issues with the other. The kingdom of God is not about walls. We also have to resist the false liturgies of might makes right. We can sing with the multitude in chapter 7 that salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. 
See, worship reminds us where our citizenship resides, as I've already mentioned. At some point, God will bring an end to evil. The kingdom of shalom will be established. And yes, it's taking a long time. But I have to believe that the God of all creation is going to redeem that creation. There's one final thing I want to mention in the last couple minutes that we have left. We have this narrative that I've just read, and it kind of seems to end in defeat. The saints of God are conquered. They are put to death because they refuse to worship. And it really seems like evil has won. Perhaps you feel that way as well when you look around at the world. But John gives us two pictures following this chapter that I just want to mention to us. One is in the very next chapter, in Revelation chapter 14, where John says, I looked, and there before me was a lamb standing at Mount Zion with the 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their forehead. Remember that mark I mentioned where God marks his own? And they're with the lamb, and they're singing a song that only they can know. The second one is in Revelation 15, and this one's much more explicit to the text that we have been talking about today. And John says that he's preparing to tell us about the last series of judgment that's going to be poured out. But he says that he saw beside the sea, standing there, those who had been victorious over the beast and its image and over the number of its name, the very people that we saw put to death in chapter 13. They had been victorious. How were they victorious? They were victorious through their death. They were victorious through their death. That might not make sense to us, but over and over again in the book of Revelation, John shows us pictures of the martyrs. Why? Because it reminds us that this life is not all there is. There is life to come. Death doesn't separate us from God. And so those who are put to death for their witness on earth are found alive and well, worshiping God in heaven, never again to suffer, to be shepherded by the lamb, and to be gathered around the throne. And so this becomes very important. And John says, they held harps given to them by God, and they sang the song of God's servant Moses and of the lamb. Great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, king of the nations. God is the king of the nations, and God will make all things right one day. Worship marks us. The way you live your life marks you. Who you worship is a choice. In the book of Revelation, that choice comes with consequences. Those who follow after the beast are cast into the lake of fire in this story. Those who follow the lamb are taken into New Jerusalem. And it might seem kind of somber, but um, I think it reinforces to us what it means to truly follow after Jesus, what it means to be a disciple, and what those consequences are, are all about. And John uh, gives us this picture in this passage. Worship marks us as those belonging to God in this life and in the life to come. Thank you. Uh, so, as usual, we've got questions coming in electronically. Uh, I will let, do you have one you want to ask yet? I'll let, I'll let him ponder those for a moment. Uh, but also raise your hands if you have a question in the audience, and I will bring you the mic. Question submitted online. Can you talk about the Battle of Armageddon and its significance to Revelations? Uh, sure. Um, there is no battle. The kings gather for war, but there is no war. Um, and of course, we get these. We get this idea from um, from Ezekiel, and um, so we we see that in in Revelation. But um, there's really no battle that that takes place. 
So I'm not sure what we do with that exactly, um, except to acknowledge that who's going to war against God? Um, God is going to be victorious. Um, so, yeah, I don't have really have a good answer for that be because the, the battle, even though we're preparing for it and we see them gathered there, a battle doesn't ensue. And that's an interesting, that's an interesting thing in the narrative. I was talking last night uh, with, with Patty um, because there are certainly pictures in the apocalypse that are, you know, disturbing um, and um, images of violence and, and, and things like that. And that, that is cer certainly true. Uh, and I'm not trying to sugarcoat those in, in any way. Um, but what seems to be interesting as well is that where we might expect complete devastation and violence, it doesn't come. So for example, we have these judgment series that I mentioned, the seven seals, the seven trumpets, and the seven bulls of plague. And so um, with each one of them, as we move from you know kind of one through seven, and the intensity kind of ratchets up, um, and so things on earth are being destroyed and plants are being burned up and, you know, stars are falling from the sky and all of this. By the time we're preparing for the seventh, meaning completion, we're really expecting it to be over. The whole earth to be destroyed and this is it. This is the end of history. But that never comes. And so I find that to be, I find that to be an interesting um, idea. Um, we don't get kind of the destruction of heaven and earth. We get all things being made new. We have a new heaven and new earth coming, but we don't have kind of these images of, of, of complete destruction or annihilation um, that we might expect. And, and so I don't honestly know what to do with all of that. It is not necessarily the area that I have, have been working on, but I do, find it in, I do find it intriguing that there seems to be some tempering of of that. Hi, thanks Hi. for speaking today. This was really interesting. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if you had any commentary on like the interpretation of the number 666, just because I've heard different things from different people and I was curious on your perspective. <laughs> Um, it, uh, no, honestly, um, <laughs> again, not, not, not my area necessarily. Um, and I wish I knew how to pronounce it. If you, if you Google it, there's actually a phobia of the number 666 and it's this long word. I, I can't pronounce it. It's, it's huge. Um, hecto, hexa, something phobia. Uh, and it's a, it is a phobia of the number 666. Seriously, look, look it up. Um, I was just realizing, like, my birthday is 12 16 66. And it just dawned on me the other day when I was walking my dog. I'm like, oh, my word, I have 666 right in my very birthday. Um, that's terrifying for a Pentecostal. Um, yeah, I mean, I've known people who have, you know, if, if, if they get gas or they do something or they have a, you know, their, their payment uh, for something at the grocery store or whatever comes up and has 666 in it, they will buy something else to change that number. I'm serious. Just that, that fear of it. You know, I think um, there's, there's lots of different theories about it. Of course, it's that whole system of gematria where um, um, uh, letters in names were used to, uh, or had numerical value. So um, most likely, most scholars, I think, hold that it was Nero's name that kind of added up to this 666. Um, some have said it's you know one number short of completion of seven, which is kind of the, the, the number of completion, and so it, it reflects that. Um, it, it has a it has a lot of it has a lot of possibilities uh, to it, uh, including you know people in our in our own day. Again, I would encourage you you know kind of look look that up and see what kind of names uh, are are listed as their names adding up to, uh, to 666. Um, but it's been something that uh, at least Pentecostals, and I think even American culture, um, if they know anything about the book of Revelation, that's it. They know 666 for sure. Another question submitted online. How should we view Revelations sim symbolically or literally? <sighs> yes. 
Right. That's it. That's a. Uh, it's an interesting question because obviously it is filled with symbolism, right? Um, but I do believe there are things that are literal, right? Um, and so I, th I think it is that tension be between um, how we how we read it and and how we understand it. Um, I think there are uh, actual um, events eschatological events that, that Revelation is showing us. Things in John's future, but things still in our future. I do believe that Revelation 19 depicts the return of Jesus. If there is a return of Jesus in the book of Revelation, I think it is Revelation 19, the rider on the white horse. Um, we have the millennium. We have uh, the great white throne judgment. We have the new heaven and the new earth. So, so we, have, we have all of these events. We have real people, I think, in the narrative. But then, yes, John is using this symbolic language, much like the book of, we see in the book of Daniel with his visions of um, you know, the, the beasts from there, a lot of apocalyptic literature that would have been um, kind of contemporary with, with Revelation, uses this kind of, um, of imagery. Um, and so in, in a sense, it's, it's kind of resistance literature. John can't say necessarily the Roman Empire is evil, the Roman emperors are evil, but John can show that through his symbolism. Um, it's, it's, it's almost like political cartooning where we, we recognize what's being communicated through the use of, of symbols. Um, and so I think, that, I think that's what John is doing uh, in, in his work. Um, and, the, and the reason for these kind of, um, um, uh, what's the word that I want, kind of extravagant images uh, is really to communicate the truth. So Jesus is the lamb standing as slain. I mean, that doesn't even make sense, right? Um, first he's called a lion, then he... John turns and he sees a lamb, and the lamb is standing as slain. Well, John's readers would understand that that is a reference to the death and resurrection of, of Jesus. Um, and so this imagery speaks to Jesus' work as, as redeemer. And so um, I think that becomes significant. The, the, Jesus is also portrayed, the lamb is portrayed as having... Um, um, the, the spirit as the eyes of the lamb being sent out into all the world. So this idea that the spirit uh, proceeds from the father and the son um, is captured in this imagery of, of the eyes. So, you know, I, I do have to kind of give a yes to that um, because I, I think we kind of go back and forth between, um, you know, symbolic but also some, some, uh, some literal um, as well. I don't know if that's satisfactory, but... Okay. Okay. Thank you. There may be many in this uh, in this audience, myself included, who would like to take definition of what does it mean to be a Pentecostal. <laughs> what does it mean to be a Pentecostal? Um, anybody know any Pentecostals? All right. Yay. If you don't, I'm right here. I am a Pentecostal. Um, so now you know one. What does it mean to be a Pentecostal? Well. Um, what? <laughs> Speaking in tongues, that's part of it, sure, absolutely. Um, I would say Pentecostals, of course, going back to um, Pentecost, Acts 2, the outpouring of, of the Holy Spirit, um, and then in the, the turn of the 20th century, kind of the Azusa Street Revival, which is where kind of modern-day Pentecostalism is, is born out of with William Seymour and, and those, so kind of uh, traditional, what we would call classical Pentecostal denominations that came out of that, like the Assemblies of God, uh, the Church of God, Church of God in Christ, um, those types of groups. So it is this, um, I would say, kind of this radical openness to to the spirit and this understanding of what we would term the baptism in, in the Holy Spirit um, with this, this understanding of, of, of tongue speech. So uh, I guess it would define it that way. Um, and uh, yeah, is that, is that helpful? Is there more you'd like me to say? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I really wrote this, I, I wrote my, my dissertation and I mentioned it last night, it's just surprising to me that anybody outside of Pentecostalism would want to read it 
because I really wrote it with, with Pentecostals in mind, and, and part of it is because of the way Pentecostals have, have read the apocalypse as kind of this, this road map, and, and that's, that's all we can see. So, you know, it's, it's trying to figure out the timeline, and when is the church going to be raptured, and, and how do we understand all that? And so because of that, we've not been able to see anything else in Revelation. And so one of the things that um, is so striking to me is that um, Revelation is just filled with worship, um, worship scenes, images of worship. Um, that seems to be an important part of, of the narrative. And, and so that's why I wanted to, you know, to kind of write about it as a way to help my own, my own tribe, uh, Pentecostals, recover the book of Revelation um, for something other than just simply trying to map out uh, end time events. Thank you for speaking. Um, my question is, what are your thoughts on heaven and or hell? Like, what do you, have you studied anything about that? And if so, what have you found? Well, in the book of Revelation, um, you have this place, the lake of fire. Um, so it is a, it is a, a reality in, in the world of, of the narrative. I guess as a Pentecostal, I would affirm both you know, heaven and hell, um, what heaven is um, would be kind of, you know, up for debate. I mean, we tend to think about heaven as up there, you know, some realm. Um, what, you know, what does that mean? Is it some location? Um, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not so sure about that. Um, it would be the abode of God, the, 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 place where, the place where God dwells. And in Revelation, it is pictured as as up, right? And so kind of that understanding of the heavens, the earth, and, and under the earth, kind of this tiered cosmology that, that exists. Um, so I, I, I do believe that um, wherever God dwells, um, that's where we will be. Um, I do believe in, um, in hell um, as a place that um, is reserved for those who choose to um, not serve God. Um, how that gets interpreted and understood, and I, I, I know I'm kind of um, struggling here to, to define this, um, how that gets understood, I, I think there are a variety of ways. Um, some talk about, you know, annihilationism, some talk about eternal torment. Um, you know, so I, I think there's a I think there's a lot of latitude there. Um, I don't think it's God's desire that anyone should go there. Um, I mentioned last night uh, again. I think talking to Patty, one of the things that I often am troubled by, and, and Pentecostals say this, and I can only speak to my own my own group. So this might not apply to anybody in this room, but sometimes I hear the language. We know the book, the end of the book, and we win, right? This very kind of understanding that, yeah, yeah, we, we, we do win, but there's almost this glee that, you know, people are going to end up in hell, and I don't think that should be our attitude. Um, we should not rejoice over anyone who would, you know, find themselves eternally separated from God. Um, and so what I think Revelation does is it should drive us towards mission. Um, I believe that it's God's desire that all come to salvation. And I believe that should, be, that should be our desire. There's no people group, there's no individuals that we should feel are outside the reach of God's love and grace. I don't know that we're going to find a better point to end on than that one. That was fantastic. <laughs> I do want to remind you all that Dr. Archer will be eating lunch in the cafeteria. Please join her table. Continue the conversation. I'll give her another round of applause, please.